Hello and welcome to the first in this calendar year of CUHK Law's Greater China Legal History Seminars. Happy New Year. Um, I'd like to welcome you all on behalf of the faculty. Uh, I can see already that we've got a considerable number of people uh, have tuned in on Zoom today for this uh, seminar. Not surprising because it is such a fascinating topic uh, given by an expert in the field. Uh, before I introduce our speaker today, can I just remind you that we are going to try and leave some time at the end for questions. And if you do have any questions, then please could you use the chat function to chat them into us and I can ask uh, Professor Miller at the end for questions. So please feel free to chat your questions in. Anyway, let me introduce our speaker today. Our speaker today is Professor Ian Miller, who is an Associate Professor of History at St. John's University in New York, where he teaches East Asian history, world history, and environmental history. He is the author of Fur and Empire, The Transformation of Forests in Early Morning Modern China, and the co-editor of The Cultivated Forest, People and Woodlands in Asian History, where he explores, among other topics, forestry contracts and their implications for our understanding of property rights, specialized ex expertise, and early securities markets. He's currently working on a monograph on graves and the emergence of kinship organizations, collective property, and environmental protection, which is tentatively titled Ancestral Shade, Kinship and Ecology in Southern China. And again, that's a great topic for a future seminar, hopefully. Uh, so, Professor Miller received his PhD in History and East Asian Languages from Harvard in, two, uh, in 2015, and between 2016 and 2018, he was a program fellow in Agrarian Studies at Yale University and a visiting scholar at the Max Planck Center for the History of Science in Berlin. In 2021 to 22, Professor Miller received a fellowship from the National Endowment for the Humanities to begin work on ancestral shade. So, without any further ado, please let me hand over to uh, Professor Miller. Hi, can you all hear me? Um, I'm good. Okay, thank you so much, Professor Gallagher, um, and and thanks also to Professor Wolf for the invitation and to Jay Wong for all the work coordinating this talk. Um, it's really exciting to have this opportunity to return to a set of questions that I've been thinking about that I've sort of put on hold, um, and so. Maybe I will go ahead and share my screen and we can think through some of these together. Are we good here with the slideshow? Yes. Okay, great. So when I started this project, this book project, I was ultimately interested in the relationship between lineage organization formation and the environment. And so feng shui forests emerged as a key point of an analysis. Scholars have long observed the presence of small groves of old trees around graves, ancestral temples, and the places where watercourses enter and exit villages. And these have been um, cultivated and protected largely through the belief in feng shui. And I expect that for much of this audience, this is a familiar um, system of, of knowledge and belief. Um, but in case it's not, uh, feng shui literally translates wind and water, and it's a way of understanding people's place in the environment, especially the place of, um, of edifices like graves and houses and temples through the flow of qi, through particular sorts of landforms, especially through the shape um, of, of mountains or the direction of water courses and things like that. And while it had key antecedents in early China, it really emerges around 1000 CE um, when we see especially the publication of, of key texts like the Book of Burial. And so in, in some way, um, and, and here's um, sort of three different depictions of, of feng shui forests in the landscape um, on the bottom left. Um, is a photo, a contemporary photo of a feng shui forest in Fujian that was taken um, by a collaborator of mine. Uh, and the upper right is a contemporary diagram of some of the types of feng shui forests that you might find in village environments, including temple forests and these different types of forests around watercourses and mountains. And in the bottom right is a historical diagram that comes out of a genealogy. Um, in this case, one that's published in the early 20th century, um, but that is probably that is certainly a copy of one um, that probably goes back an additional few hundred years. And so 
these feng shui forests in some ways fit into both broader and longer term trends. Um, so we see spatially sacred forests of some form are widespread probably everywhere that you can find trees. So maybe not in the Arctic, um, but here are sacred forests from India, Japan, uh, Ethiopia, and a depiction of, of sort of ancestors associated with, um, with tree species in, um, in a Mayan document um, from, from Central America. And I could fill up slides with other examples of these. Uh, temporally, grave and temple forests were certainly present in China no later than the Warring States period, when they're described in the writings of a variety of philosophers, inclu including Mozi, including Zhuangzi, um, and, and others. And we can also see examples of um, tomb forests and temple forests depicted on these grave tiles from uh, the Middle Han era. And um, if we believe Hayashi Minao, and I, I happen to, to believe his analysis, um, the similarity of the designs on these panels to those seen on even earlier objects from, for example, um, these sites in, um, in the, uh, from the Chinese Neolithic suggests that in fact, these jades are microcosmic versions of these sort of macrocosmic temples, which may have existed an additional few thousand years earlier and likewise been planted with sacred trees. Um, and um, these types of sacred forests show great continuity up to the present day, despite substantial disruptions in the past century or two. That being said, um, Fung, I'll go back. Feng Shui forests present some interesting paradoxes, um, and they represent a different way of conceptualizing the environment, and in particular the sacred environment, than those seen in classical and medieval sacred forests. Um, they, they seem to exist both within the contractual realm, we can find numerous deeds to grave forests or to temple forests, but they also exist something somewhat outside of the contractual realm. The prices given in these deeds are ridiculous, and they make all kinds of exceptions to the standard adjudication of land ownership and other issues. So these are some issues that I actually first started thinking about for my dissertation, but then I wanted to figure out if feng shui forests are exceptional, I'd better figure out how, quote unquote, normal forests worked. And so I researched and wrote this book for an empire, um, which describes how Chinese courts and Chinese uh, tree farmers, I guess, began to register forests as property and how the real work of defining their use and ownership then fell into the realm of private contracts. And I'm not gonna go into any more depth on, in this, but I'll be happy to take any questions that you might have on this book or this research at the end. Um, and so anyway, I have returned in the last few years to the Lineage Ecology Project, as I think of it, which is hopefully going to one day soon yield a book provisionally titled Ancestral Shade, Kinship and Ecology in Southern China. And this is the provisional table of contents. And so basically what I'm tracing is sort of the emergence of feng shui forests in the long durée, starting by thinking about antecedents in classical and medieval China, and then thinking about the emergence of lineage organizations um, with genealogies, graves and land deeds, and feng shui itself in the Song and Yuan, and then the transformation of these institutions in the Ming and Qing. And so what I'm presenting today uh, really represents material that's largely drawn from what I'm currently thinking of as chapter seven, um, grave matters, law and feng shui in the Ming and Qing. And so when professors Wolf and Gallagher wrote to me, I was down a rather strange rabbit hole, actually maybe down several rabbit holes simultaneously trying to understand feng shui theory, looking into the deep classical antecedents of feng shui forests in the classical and medieval periods. And so thanks to their invitation, um, I, as a Ming and Qing historian, returned to much more familiar context um, in the time period and the types of documents that I know a little bit better. And so what I want to do today is zoom out a bit and present the curious problem of feng shui in late imperial Chinese law, in Ming and Qing law. And to do that, I'd like to focus on the question of property rights. And so 
here's an outline of the talk. First, I'm going to argue that feng shui presented an older or at least a different way of thinking about property rights that persisted alongside a private contractual land regime. Second, I'm going to ask why this matters. Um, why did this form of property regime persist past the advent of a regime that theoretically should have been much more efficient at handling resources? And so in particular, thinking about the question of economic development and thinking about the question of common pool resources, communal property, and this idea of the tragedy of the commons. Then I'm going to delve a little bit of background in the pre-Ming history of, um, of grave law in particular, um, and a little bit on feng shui and lineage development before getting into the heart of the talk, which is on the Ming Qing developments. And this is split into three components. So I'm going to think a little bit about how this, this comes out in formal law, how it's reflected in the code and commentary and some of the new precedent that gets added to the code over time. Then I'm going to turn to litigation. And the reason for this is that I'm going to argue that the major reason why the code needed to be amended and why new law had to develop was in response to grassroots litigation. And so if we have to, if we want to understand the logic of how feng shui infiltrates law, we have to turn to those materials. They're also just sort of strange and fascinating. Um, and then I'm going to briefly think about how feng shui um, impacts the type of evidence that could be presented in a Ming or Qing court. Um, and before talking about some preliminary conclusions. Um, and so this obviously is going to cover a lot of territory, a lot of temporal territory, um, a lot of sort of theoretical territory. And so I'll be happy to dig into any of these details more um, if anyone wants to ask a question at the end. Um, so let's start by thinking about how feng shui coexisted, sometimes in complementary ways, sometimes in strange, contradictory ways with a contractual property rights order. And to do that, I'm going to use a series of surveys of regional customs that were done by the very late Qing state and the Republican state in preparation for compiling civil and commercial codes. Um, I'm sure that many members of this audience probably know far more about the civil and commercial codes than I do. I'm interested in this because it gives us a little bit of a snapshot of what the property rights looked like at this point in time. And specifically, the records of these surveys demonstrate that in many parts of Southern China, property rights were based on all kinds of non-standard documentation, or in some cases, no documentation at all. They were subdivided in irregular ways, and they interacted in complex ways with feng shui. So, what we see from these surveys is that there are some places where, um, including um, Southern Jiangxi, Gannan, including parts of Fujian, where graves and feng shui often formed a primary source of claims to property in land. Genealogies in some cases, or even graves themselves, stood in place of other forms of more formal documentation, such as land deeds or government land registers. There are other places in Southern China, such as Western Hunan, where there were clear distinctions drawn between rights to what was called in property, which were graves, versus rights to yang property, which were productive farmland, forests, houses, and things like that. But feng shui nonetheless impacted the articulation of both forms of claim. Um, in, in fact, better formal documentation of land claims did not guarantee that feng shui would remain of marginal importance. And sort of what I'm calling Greater Huizhou, Huizhou Prefecture and surrounding parts of Southern Anhui, uh, Northeastern Jiangxi, maybe some of Western Zhejiang, have some of the best documented landholding regimes in the Ming and Qing. There are thousands of contracts extant from Huizhou going back to the Song. There are some of the only Ming and Qing cadastral records that are still extant are also from Huizhou. And yet, even in this place, which has really great sort of standard uh, uh, contractual cadastral records, feng shui also impacted decisions here. It was a big deal. Scholarship from the late Qing and Republican archives seems to confirm this, this sort of hazy notion that we get from these surveys. 
Du Zheng Zhen's work on Zhejiang, Tristan Brown's new excellent new book, Laws of the Land on Sichuan, show the extent to which feng shui impacted the resolution of disputes over land use in the late Qing and Republican periods. Um, and in fact, more broadly, estimates by both contemporary and historical scholars suggest that feng shui disputes or grave disputes, which were often feng shui disputes, made up anywhere between 10 to 50 percent of lawsuits in a variety of local jurisdictions, probably averaging something like a quarter to a third of lawsuits in much of southern China and as much as half in areas that were notorious for um, rampant belief in feng shui, um, such as parts of Taiwan, Huizhou, or southern Jiangxi. Um, and so, and what we see here is that land disputes that use deeds or other forms of formal evidence were relatively easy to resolve and they were relatively easy for the Republican state to register under their new land regime. Sometimes they used non-standard subdivisions of rights and responsibilities, things like um, Yitian Liangzhu, right? One field with two masters where the subsoil rights and the surface rights were sold separately or, um, or other things like that, um, passed through tax accounts. Um, they might use non-standard forms of measurement or, um, but other, in other ways, the format was fairly standard and it was relatively easy to figure out how to resolve and transition these to a more standardized form of, um, of evidence. On the other hand, ownership claims based on feng shui took far longer to adjudicate and they were much more difficult to deal with because they were based in a fundamentally different understanding of rights to land. So if we compare these sorts of these um, claims based in these different sources of evidence, we see very different pictures. Deeds, um, pre modern Ming Qing deeds start with a, a, a clear chain of title. They state how the property was inherited or purchased, um, for how much money, when. They articulate clear boundaries, generally orthogonal boundaries, sort of square or rectangular plots. They use a, a language of relatively uniform rights and responsibilities within these boundaries. Um, and when there is subdivision of these rights and responsibilities, it's usually articulated in clear clauses in either the original deed or in additional contracts that are used to deal with tenancy and things like that. And so despite a range of complications that might unbundle the traditional set of rights, um, such as permanent tenancy, pass-through accounts, conditional sales, this nonetheless marked a fairly strong um, contractual property regime. By contrast, feng shui claims look much fuzzier. They start with an ancestor and the rights at least nominally remain with the ancestor. Um, and so then there's the problem of how to deal with making decisions about those um, about properties um, that are claimed through feng shui. And there, there are additional complications because the leadership in the lineage is typically inherited along at least three distinct lines. There's the ritual heirs, which is passed through a line of eldest son to eldest son. Um, but then there are the elders. So the oldest living members of the lineage have another leadership role and also anyone with a degree or who's studying for a degree or who has an official title um, is another source of leadership. In terms of the shape of feng shui claims, instead of these nice, neat, square plots, we get these sort of dendrites where the claim originates at a node or a niche in the middle, the grave or the temple, but then the claims um, flow through these veins or dragon veins, a long mai, or um, various other terms. Um, and so they don't necessarily end at the formal boundaries of the plot, but they can extend in different directions through the landscape. The rights. Um, claims within this territory also vary within the territory. They also vary socially and they vary by form of use. And finally, in addition to the property itself, the grave or the temple that is the anchoring point for feng shui claims, they also often anchor larger corporate properties. Um, and so um, temples, schools, graves were often the nexus of trusts where an ancestor was um, the same one that owned the grave or temple was also endowed with fields or forests or shops or even financial instruments um, such as money lending accounts or futures contracts 
And so this also made these properties the focal point of these trusts. Um, and so here's sort of what this looks like um, on a document uh, in space. And so on the left-hand side, th these are a series of, um, of cadastral plots. Um, I believe this is from Huijo. I, I should have put a, um, a label on this, but in any case, um, these are, three of them are forest plots. One is a dry land plot, and you can see that they're nice and orthogonal. They have the name of the plot recorded on the right-hand side um, and the owners, and then the boundaries. And on the left-hand side, there are any of these um, shareholding arrangements and things like that. And they're nice and square. By contrast, this feng shui map on the right, um, you have this node at the center, which in this case is a tzutang. It's a it's a family temple. It's an ancestral temple, and these sort of mushroom shapes behind it um, are the places that impacted the feng shui um, of this temple most directly, and that therefore it made some claims on the use or articulation of this land, um, as well as this dotted line, which um, runs through the middle of it, which indicates a water course, and which likewise was very significant to the feng shui. And so you have this sort of uneven distribution of uses and claims where the fields directly in front of the temple might not have a huge amount of impact on, um, on the feng shui of the temple, but these mountains much more distant, um, the sort of, they're sometimes called grandfather mountains, um, further distant into space might impact the feng shui and therefore um, be affected by the land claim. Um, so what is going on here? Clearly, feng shui is not in opposition to a strong property rights regime. It's instead doing something in parallel, maybe complementary to it. And so I think to better understand this, um, oh, here's some more maps. Um, I'm going to skip past these, but maybe I can return to these at the end. These are some more cadastral maps. This is another map of graves um, in the landscape for, for use um, in, um, in resolving feng shui. Um, but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to skip past that to think about what is at stake. And so I think to, to talk about this, um, we, we can think about what property rights are often theorized as meaning. And so this can be broken down um, often based on sort of late Roman law into the right to use the property, the right to earn income or use products from the property and the right to destroy or alienate the property. And in a lot of the, the sort of um, economic history of China, there's a lot of emphasis put on this question of alienation, of the ability to sell the property freely because there are a lot of limits on this. And in fact, feng shui was one of the things that put limits on the ability to buy or sell a property freely. Um, and so why did this matter? There's an argument that strong property rights give an incentive, an economic incentive to develop the property, generating capital and making technological improvements and ultimately leading to economic development. And in addition, by determining who is responsible for the property, anything that is not clearly articulated in a contract, um, we ultimately know who is in charge and therefore disputes can be pre prevented when the contracts are incomplete. And so there are a number of historians of China who have raised the question of whether the lineage system and the limits that it placed on property rights prevented capital accumulation and economic development. Uh, I'm gonna focus on the English language scholarship here. I'm sure that there's significantly more. Um, and so for example, Tai Su Zhang and Christopher Isaac, among others have argued that the limitations that the state and lineages placed on the free sale of land, the free alienation of land, got in the way of economic development. Basically, it made it hard for entrepreneurial landlords to acquire large properties and improve them um, because it was hard for people to buy and sell land freely. The lineage system got in the way. And, and feng shui was sort of one of those things that got in the way. On the other hand, there are some other scholars, including Madeline Zellin, Joseph McDermott, um, Jessica Hanzer, who have shown various ways that Chinese investors were able to raise capital for substantial investments in trade, in industry, in finance, despite these potential blockages on the alienation of land placed by lineages. And um, so 
I don't want to belabor this too much and without going into a huge amount more detail, my position on this, what I would suggest is that it was actually the Ming Qing rest restrictions on debt and securitization um, that were much greater barriers to capital accumulation and investment than the restrictions on land use and alienation. Um, but th that's sort of neither here nor there, and I'm happy to take questions or comments on it at the end. Um, one of the reasons why I tend to think this is that while I'm not an expert on British and Dutch capitalism, it seems to me that the story of capitalism in Europe is much less about capital accumulation through land improvement than it is about capital accumulation through foreign trade, through lending, and through outright looting. Um, a lot of the money, as I understand it, that ends up in British corporations is basically robbed from India um, or, um, or from the Spanish treasure galleons or things like that. So as a counterpoint, I think it's important to think about whether maybe feng shui forests are doing something else. Maybe they are institutions that have emerged to govern common pool resources. And that's one of the reasons why we see them used in parallel for these other contractual mechanisms for governing property rights. And the reason why they emerge in parallel is that they're governing different kinds of goods. And here I find Margaret McKeon's work very useful in thinking about how different types of goods um, make it easier or harder to exclude other people from use. And also different types of goods either are harmed by use or are non-subtractable. In other words, it doesn't so much matter if other people use them. And so using this, this way of thinking about different forms of, um, of property um, or different forms of good, she divides property or goods into four rather than two categories, rather than just private and, and common pool resources. Um, we can see that there's actually a difference between common pool goods, which make exclusion difficult, but which are hurt by overuse versus something like a club good, which um, like membership in a club where it's easy to exclude people, but it actually doesn't hurt you so much if other people use the resource. Um, and so why does that matter? I, I happen to think, and I'll return to this later, that one of the things that feng shui is doing is it's being used to create barriers around both common pool goods and club goods, but also to distinguish between the two. So aside from McKeon, another set of common models of common pool resources are the tragedy of the commons, which is essentially this idea that a common pool resource, a resource that's open to anyone is inevitably going to be overused unless there's a strong state, unless there's a strong government that creates regulations to prevent it from being overused. Uh, or the alternative approach which is taken in, um, in a fair amount of the older um, economic scholarship, which is the prisoner's dilemma, which is basically the idea that multiple actors will not reach an optimal level of use because they're each going to be afraid of overdoing it. And so this will tend to lead to underuse and the only solution to the underuse of common pool resources or the best solution to the underuse of common pool resources is privatization. And in response to this, Eleanor Ostrom's highly influential work showed through both theory and case studies that common pool resources can in fact be successfully governed without leading to either the tragedy of the commons um, or to underuse, as long as they tended to meet certain design principles in, involving clear boundaries and membership, rules, monitoring, and sanctions for if the rules are broken, um, as well as things about the structure of the organization, including collective choice, um, dispute resolution mechanisms, and so on. And so um, here again, I think that this is a set of questions that we should return to when we see how feng shui disputes are playing out. Um, are they meeting some of these design principles that Ostrom has identified in terms of clear boundaries, including in, in terms of sanctions, um, in terms of mechanisms for, uh, for resolving disputes? Um, and is, is this sort of what is going on here? So um, I hope this was not too much uh, sort of theoretical and historiographical background uh, because now we're going to get to the historical background.
And since this is a talk on the Ming-Ching legal developments, I don't want to belabor this either, but I do think it provides important context. And so first, regarding grave law in the long term, I think there are some important shifts that we can see um, over a very long period of time. And um, so this begins with the grave officials listed in the rights of Joe, which is a, a problematic text that needs to be treated very carefully. But at the very least, it indicates that there was some recognized need to handle grave disputes going back at least to, shall we say, the early Han, which is probably when this text was compiled. Moving forward into the Han and especially the, the post-Han period, the Jin, um, we have a bunch of what are known as Mai Di Chen, um, grave deeds, which are the earliest known deeds that show the full contractual form that, um, that list the buyers and sellers, prices, uh, boundaries, and clauses for what happens if the contract um, is violated. The only other known contracts of similar age are for debts. And there are a few things that look a little bit like land deeds, but they're incomplete. Um, so the only complete land deeds that we have of this age are in fact deeds to graves. And that's really significant. The Tong Code moving forward is the origin point of a lot of formalized law regarding graves, and it originates four major statutes. The first is what happens if you plow someone else's grave over. The second deals with grave desecration and the failure to bury corpses in a timely manner. The third has to do with cutting trees on noble tombs. And the fourth with the destruction of grave statuary and tablets, which were um, also the provenance of nobles and which were used to mark noble tombs as a monument. Moving into the Song Dynasty, um, the, the Song's initial code adopts the Tang Code verbatim with only a little bit of additional precedent on cremation and water burial. But then in the 11th century, some, some pretty important things to do. Uh, they start to do some pretty important things. The first is they extend a lot of the protections that were previously uh, special to noble graves, to noble tombs, to the graves of commoners as well. In the 12th century, the turn that this takes is a lot of these protections are specifically for lineage cemeteries. They are for graves that are operated by a lineage organization. And so these protections against um, free sale of graves and the land surrounding them, against future burials in these lands, against cutting trees, all require approval from the broader kin group and if this land is sold without that approval, there is an unlimited redemption period um, for the land to be returned to the lineage. In addition, the, um, the Song begins to resolve some of the question of how we're going to deal with the lines between a contractual property regime and a regime of property that derives from the grave um, and from these, these sort of older um, traditions around the grave by limiting the protections that the grave grants to a specifically delimited square plot around the grave itself. Then in the Yuan, there's some really, really important precedent that's going to shape everything that goes forward, especially in the Ming and into the Qing. And this is a series of rulings that grave sale for feng shui is equivalent to desecration. So what's going on that produces these rulings? There's a rash of cases, mostly from central Jiangxi, where people are exhuming their ancestors and selling the burial locations because these are seen as places with good feng shui. And because they're seen as places with good feng shui, they can make a lot of money by selling the spots. The cases work their way up to the central courts and the central courts say, this is ridiculous. We need to do something about this. And there's not really a good way to handle it on the books. And so what they decide to do is they say, if a descendant exhumes their ancestors and sells the location, that's equivalent to desecration. It's basically equivalent to grave robbing. And in addition to this, if this act causes the ancestor worship to end, there, there's an aggravating um, category um, that applies. And so this is an aggravated crime. It's a more severe crime. 
Um, the, the particular aggravating category is um, is uh, is called uni. Um, it's one of the ten great evils in in uh, in Ming Qing legal practice, and it's basically applies. It's an aggravating factor that applies to crimes that are committed by juniors against their seniors. Um, and so this is a really important piece of precedent that gets issued right around 1300. So what are the takeaways from these, these major shifts? The first, going back to these grave deeds um, and some of these, these very, very early materials, is that graves may actually be the point of origin of property rights or at least of the contractual form. This is an argument that Valerie Hansen has made. Um, and I, I'm actually somewhat um, convinced here, um, in particular because it's in keeping with patterns that we can observe elsewhere, um, in especially in early societies, where property rights may come from this idea of taboo, literally something that's not to be touched. And from this idea that the land belongs to the gods and the ancestors, and they're the ones that need to be compensated if you're going to, to bury someone, if you're going to use the land in particular ways um, or what have you. And um, the second thing is that the song in particular shows, or I guess it's the third thing on here, is that um, Grave law begins with an emphasis on nobles, and in particular with tombs as a site of noble display. Um, this is where you you plant these big forests, which you can see from far away, uh, from from far away, and you know that this was an important person who was buried here. And if you get closer, there's all these statuary and stelae that tell you who this um, this important figure was. And the song marks an important transition away from this. There are still noble graves, there are still elite graves, um, but the laws around graves shift from ones that are oriented toward protecting noble tombs to laws that are protecting all graves that are managed by lineage organizations. So what was going on in the Song and Yuan that prompted these significant changes? The first is that this is a period of widespread lineage formation. This is when a lot of the lineage organizations that survive into the Ming and Qing um, trace their point of origin really to, in many cases, to the 11th century. Um, and this is typified in the, the records by the origins of genealogies, the emergence of joint ritual of the extended kin group, and by some forms of early corporate properties that are owned and managed by the lineage collectively. This is also a period of increased commercialization and contractualization of the landscape. Um, this is a process that started before the Song, but it really comes to a head in the 11th and 12th centuries. And what's really crucial here is that before the Song, before this transformation, graves were some of the only property that families held in perpetuity and transmitted to their heirs. Farmland in the Tang and before that returned to the government, at least nominally, to be redistributed to another farmer. But after this transition, Farmland, forests, ponds, all kinds of productive property are also becoming heritable property. They're also governed by this realm of uh, government cadastres and private land deeds. And this meant that grave law had to reflect a really important shift, that graves in the Tang and before had been an exceptional part of the land system. They were one of the only things owned in perpetuity by a family. And now they've become something that's part of a much broader tapestry of long-term durable rights to land that can be transmitted to heirs. And as I mentioned, one of the really important things about Song Law is that it resolves this question. In the late 12th century, a number of rulings make their way up through the jurisdictions and the court rules about how graves interact with these other forms of property. Basically, they ruled that the special protections to graves the unlimited period of redemption, the special protections against logging or burial are limited to the grave plot itself, which is given a fixed size. There's even a ruling which clarifies the size of the plot. There are also a bunch of clarifications of edge cases, such as what to do if grave sh trees shade neighboring farmland, or what to do when the plot surrounding the grave is sold. The third thing that happens in the Song and Yuan is there's a major shift in geomancy itself. 
In the 11th century, and probably for several centuries before that, the prevailing form of geomancy that was used for burial was called the five tones model. And this used the surname of the deceased individual to determine the appropriate orientation of the grave. Um, the, all the surnames were divided into five categories and depending on which category you were, the direction that your grave faced and the time that you were buried and stuff like this was all supposed to be determined. Um, from the 12th century on, especially in the South, feng shui gains prominence. And this bases the idea that burials should be determined based more in the characteristics of the landscape itself rather than the characteristics of the deceased. In other words, you should follow the shape of the mountains, you should follow the orientation of the compass, um, and things like this to determine what is a good burial location. Um, one of the other really important things, and this is something that happens in the Yuan, is they institutionalize um, yin yang masters, yin yang professors in the 1290s. And so before this, feng shui masters are this sort of unclear situation. Their people sort of look down on them and they don't have a huge amount of social status. In the 1290s, the Yuan creates a new class of official who have oversight over all kinds of issues dealing with divination, dealing with compiling calendars, uh, rainmaking ritual, and including feng shui. And so this gives a lot more oversight over these types of issues. This is actually one of the reasons why there's a huge amount of really important precedent related to feng shui that gets created in the mid yuan. Um, I have a slide on major events in this period um, that I can return to if I get questions on this. Um, for now, I, I am just going to sort of point out that these have to do with some of um, some early and well-known examples of genealogy compilation um, by, by Ouyang Xiao and Su Xun, among others, and the compilation of the most important um, book on feng shui in the later period, the Book of Burial, which has a version circulating before 1150, but the version that circulates after, shall we say, 1400, is the version that is edited first by Tsai Fa and in, in the 1150s, and then by Wu Cheng in the early 1300s. And so this text that is a major feng shui text is transformed in the Song and Yuan period as well, as, um, as well as lineage organization being transformed in this period. But, um, and I can return to that if, if anyone has questions, but I think it's time to get to, to the Ming and Qing um, because I'm probably halfway through my time or something like that. And, uh, and so uh, let's move on. So once again, I wanna start this section with a high level survey of what's going on here. And so let's begin with the Ming code, which is the first major code compilation in a few hundred years. And nominally the Ming code was based in the Tang code, but it massively reorganizes the laws. And what we see in the case of the laws on graves is the two of the four Tang statutes the one on plowing graves and the one on desecration end up in a single law on, um, on uncovering graves, on desecration. Um, so does the key UN precedent that selling graves for feng shui reasons was equivalent to desecration and that ceasing ancestor worship is an aggravating factor. So this all ends up in this one song law. Um, there are two additional statutes on dealing with noble and imperial tombs, but it's clear from looking at some of the jurisprudence around these statutes in the Ming that they only really apply to noble graves once again. And so we've actually lost some of the key Song precedent that extended these protections to non-noble graves. And we've lost the statute on, what to, on grave statuary and grave stele. There is a direct mention of feng shui in the Ming code as well. It's in the law on funerals and burial and it provides a punishment for people who delay burial for reasons of feng shui. Um, that's the only mention of feng shui in the code directly. Um, and so there's some, some interesting things here. One is that we see again, the shift away from noble status as an important element of grave law. And the second is that the Ming code is really much less based on the Tang code than it claims to be. And in fact, it loses a huge amount of song precedent um, in other areas as well, the Yuan actually turns out to be a really critical period in the formation of the law that ends up in the Ming Code. 
I think that's a really important takeaway. And in the case of grave law, the loss of this precedent ends up, this, this Song precedent ends up handicapping Ming jurists in some really interesting ways. They seem to be unsure of what to do with the special protection that people are claiming for graves. Um, and this is an issue that the Song courts had already resolved, but instead they end up with this paradox, which is on the one hand, the law punishes the sale of graves, which was something that people often did because of feng shui, but the law also increases the protections for graves against various forms of desecration. And people are trying to use these to claim much broader control over other types of land. Um, in fact, this becomes this, this law on desecration becomes a backdoor for feng shui claims. In particular, the clause that derives from the UN rulings becomes a backdoor for feng shui claims. It's worth noting that the Ming also inherits Yidyang officials from the UN. Um, and so they also have this type of oversight over a variety of things, but end up spending a lot of their time on feng shui. So next we move to three collections of precedents. Um, it's been noted that the Ming founder intended the Ming code to be a permanent and unchanging legal document. But of course it didn't work very well. Uh, first of all, it was a flawed document. And second of all, it needed to respond to changes in society. And so gradually officials did begin compiling collections of key precedent. Uh, first in the Huangming Tiaohua Shilei Zun, from, uh, which compiled cases from 1464 to, 90, to 1494. And then in a series of Wenxing Tiao Li, um, clauses and precedents for juridical interrogation is maybe a, a decent translation. Um, the first one from 1500, which basically copies most of the Huangming Tiaohua um, the second from 1526, and the third from 1585, by which time it was appended to the code and became increasingly formalized. So what ends up in these collections is a bunch of new precedent that fall on graves that falls into two areas. First, there was apparently a really big problem with grave robbing, especially in North China, um, and especially robbing the graves of aristocrats of the, the deep past, and the court responds by increasing the penalties for this and specifying additional penalties for things that were sort of a gray area before, like what happens if you take the bricks from a tomb um, or things like that. But the thing that's much more interesting for our purposes is there's a rash of cases that involve jurisdictional problems. And they're especially coming out of central Jiangxi, which I remind you is exactly where all the feng shui cases in the Yuan are coming out of central Jiangxi. And so these two things are clearly related. Um, feng shui and grave disputes are listed as just one part of these jurisdictional problems, which touch on other types of land dispute, brawls, debts, and a range of other things. And collectively, what the Ming court does is to characterize them as two sets of social problems. The first social problem is the problem of magnate power. And the second social problem is the problem of excessive litigiousness. So what do they mean by magnate power? They mean there are these situations where weaker households are being compelled to give their property to stronger ones. And here, I think it's useful to remember Fu Yiling's observation that in many cases, magnate and gentry were two sides of the same coin. In other words, there were certain families, um, often old families, often ones with strong lineage organizations that dominated their localities through a combination of basically being big bullies and owning a lot of land, but also by succeeding in the exams and writing poetry and things like this, monopolizing sub-bureaucratic offices. The problem of excessive litigiousness is also an interesting one because in the Ming and Qing, third party litigation was illegal. It was illegal to be a lawyer in the Ming and Qing. If you wanted to bring a suit, you had to bring it in person. Um, and so there's all kinds of crazy stuff that comes out of this where people are like paying elderly people to bring their lawsuits because they think that the court is not going to beat an old man if he brings a you know, third party litigation um, and, and all kinds of, of sort of fascinating stuff in its own right. Um, and so, um, but feng shui is also one of these things that's where you have these lawsuits that are being brought by the wrong people in the wrong jurisdiction. In particular, people are bringing suits in higher courts than they're supposed to be bringing them. 
And so I think that two things are going on, at least regarding feng shui. The first is that gentry or magnate families are using feng shui as a way to consolidate power, both through the feng shui of their own tombs, which they're using to claim control of surrounding lands, but also by trying to take over other tombs of people living in the locality, either through coercion or by buying it or by falsifying documents or uh, um, a number of other things. And so feng shui is becoming a way of another way of exerting dominance. And that's how it's appearing in these cases. The other is that litigation is emerging and causing all kinds of weird problems because there's a lack of clarity in the Ming law, especially with respect to feng shui claims. Having lost the Song precedent that strictly limited grave protections to small square plots, the relationship between graves and the surrounding land needed to be relitigated. And on top of that, these problems of magnate dominance fed into litigation in two ways. First of all, the magnates are some of the people bringing these lawsuits as ways to try to pressure people to give up their land. And the second is that people who were being pressured by these powerful families are messing with jurisdiction to try to avoid magnate power. If you have a family that's really powerful in this county, the solution to, to being dominated by them is to go outside of the county to try to bring the lawsuit in a higher jurisdiction or simply in a different jurisdiction. Um, and so the Ming court responds to these early cases in two paradoxical ways. On the one hand, by specifying that higher authorities should intervene in more of these local disputes. Um, they, they say magistrates, prefects, even the brocade guard, which is, um, which is sort of the spy network um, or something like that, if you will, should intervene directly in these cases that, that hinge on magnate power. But on the other hand, they also issue these rulings that local cases should stay in the locality, that they should not be bringing this litigation way outside of the appropriate jurisdiction. And so um, suffice to say that these two conflicting trends and these two conflicting approaches to resolving them did not resolve the problem of feng shui. And so by the 16th century, we start to see more direct solutions. They start actually amending the laws. Um, first, magnate abuses of feng shui are added to this catch-all law on what should not be done, Bu Wei, in 1526. And then eventually, in 1585, um, a clause is added taking some of the language from the law on desecration and actually putting it in the law on landed property on the illicit sale of fields and houses. And this is what this is the language that gets added to this um, to this law. If de if defendants, uh, sorry, if descendants consign their commonly held ancestral grave plots to a variety of powerful interests, princely courts, inner and out of outer officials or other powerful families, and if they fabricate deeds and um, uh, to, to aid in this, then the person who consigns the land to a powerful family is sent for military service, um, which was something close to a death sentence um, and, um, and just a rather unpleasant punishment to begin with. And the grave plot is returned to the same lineage. And so what we're seeing is something like this, this uh, custom of unlimited redemption of grave land that is sold or transferred improperly is finally in 1585 working its way into Ming law um, in a formal way. Um, in the Qing, this trend continues. Um, and uh, so in particular, I wanna highlight a series of, of, um, of ways that this develops in the Qianlong period between 1740 and 1756. And so there are some antecedents to this in the Qing. Um, in 1718, the military command in Beijing prohibited the felling of grave trees. In 1740, the governor of Zhejiang clarified the protections for graves. Um, but this is the really important thing, which seems to maybe emerge from these local um, changes, which is the court changes the language on this, this law on stealing trees from the Imperial Mausoleum 
and applies it not just to the imperial mausoleum, but to commoners' ancestral graveyards as well. And um, this, this is sort of, I mean, it's a little bit complicated because it actually says that stealing graves from ancestral graveyards can be a few different types of crime. Um, and so if descendants sell trees from their own ancestral graveyards, this is a violation of orders and it should be resolved under that law. For those who steal trees from the graveyards of others, this is theft and should be resolved under the law under theft. And those who, um, who steal and sell houses, steli, bricks, tiles, or lumber from tombs are punished under this law, which is to say the law on stealing trees from the imperial mausoleum. And depending on the circumstance, the illicit materials are either seized by the state or returned to their appropriate owners. Um, and this is really only the beginning of this, this spread of protections from the grave itself to some of these other things. Um, it continues in the 1750s when a member of the Grand Sec Secretariat, Fu Hung, sends this memorial um, arguing about the importance of trees within graveyards. And this is exciting because he says specifically that graveyard trees matter because they are related to feng shui. Um, and so this, is, this language of feng shui does not end up in the formal law, but in the documents that sort of lead to the issuing of this law, they're talking about feng shui. Um, in response to um, Uh, in response to this, the law on cutting trees in the Imperial Mausoleum, um, the one that I just showed you, is amended to further increase the penalties. And there are a series of requests for clarification from the governor of, of Jiangsu. Um, first, the question, does this law apply just in Beijing or throughout the empire? The answer, it applies throughout the empire. He then um, writes a memorial arguing that similar regulations to apply not just to grave trees, but to all corporately owned lineage property. And the Board of Punishments agrees. And so they argue that the 1585 precedent, that we, the 1585 clause added to the illicit sale of fields and houses should apply in this case. And in keeping with this, the law on illicit sale of fields and houses was amended to include penalties for the sale of fields that financed ancestral ritual and ancestral temples. Finally, in the early 1800s, this law was even further extended to other commonly held lineage property. Okay, so what can we conclude from this trend? Clearly, there were some important lacuna in the law as expressed in the Ming Code, which left room for abuses. And in the mid-Ming, there are lots of disputes that are coming out of this. And eventually, by the mid-1700s, the law caught up to both popular and elite demands for greater feng shui protections, not just for graves, but also for grave trees and for the surrounding plots, and eventually to much of the corporate property that was endowed to graves. Notably, the protections that you end up with in Qing law, in mid Qing law, are significantly greater than those granted to graves in the mid Song, which clearly indicated the infiltration of feng shui principles into the resolution of grave disputes. In the later stages of this transition, the impetus for the changes bubbled up through the bureaucracy. But in its earlier stages, it appears to have come from litigation and um, the very litigation that the Ming court attempted to limit. And so to better understand this, let's turn to what we know about this litigation. Um, Professor Gallagher, can I ask real quick how much, how I'm doing on time? Right, you've got, well, we've got a half an hour left. So sort of 20, okay. 25 minutes would be good. Just for a 20, 25 minutes. minutes. Okay. Um, I will have to move a little bit quickly, but I will do that. Okay. Thanks. Good. Um, so in the Ming and early Qing, this period when we think bottom up litigation was the main source of changes in grave law, the main source that we have for this is case books. Um, unlike the mid to late Qing, when we have some really great legal archives, for the Ming, this is sort of what we're stuck with. Um, and most notably, the anonymous manuals of litigation masters. And these are just, I love these sources. They're incredible. They have these really cool titles like totally terrifying legal experts. 
and Xiao Wenzhou's Snowdrift of Case Files. Xiao Wenzhou, by the way, are famous legal officials from the Han um, or uh, various things like this. And, and um, they're anonymous and they often have these, these incredibly uh, incredible fictitious names of the authors. For example, um, the R.B. Kenting, the brush, pin, brush Pen Hat Pins Critical Points is written by a guy who calls himself um, the falsehood dispelling hermit of a lesser utopia uh, or something like this. Um, so anyway, uh, I'm getting distracted. But um, again, these are illegal. Um, nonetheless, lots of people did third party lit litigation. Um, we know that a lot of these people are on the margins of the exam system. They're failed exam candidates and students and things like this. Um, and many of these same people actually incidentally also find work as feng shui masters. Um, and so these litigation manuals are heavily suppressed, but, and they largely circulate in manuscript. And most of the extant copies are from the 17th, 18th and 19th centuries. But you'll notice from the titles that many of these are new editions, which means that they were circulating before this. Um, some of these are circulating certainly by the mid 1500s. Um, it's also worth noting that there are some, a few scattered instances of litigation that appear in other places, including in officials, collections of their own memorials, and including in genealogies. And using the cases that appear in some of these maybe um, more respected sources or more reliable sources, um, we can probably confirm that cases similar to those that appear in these case books um, we're working their way through the legal system in the in the late 1400s and early 1500s, if not before then. So in other words, the cases that made their way into these manuals were probably part of the major upswell of litigation um, from the late 1400s and early 1500s. And by the mid to late 1500s, they were circulating in manuals. By the 1600s, the manuals began to acquire a fairly standard format and frequently copied the same sets of cases from one another. What did these cases show? Um, grave litigation was mostly not about desecration, or at least it was mostly not principally about desecration. There are often cases of desecration that are buried in what are essentially property disputes or what are essentially disputes over environmental damage, where, for example, um, some guy goes and cuts down trees on another guy's tomb, and in response, the other guy goes and kicks in the first guy's um, ancestral grave, things like that. Um, but the main crimes covered, um, uh, but desecration is the main thing that is covered by the law before the late 1500s. Instead, litigation is about a lot of the things that are missing from the law that then end up in the law by the 1750s, 1760s. Things about property rights, about feng shui, about environmental damage. Um, so let's move on and look at some of these sample cases. So here's a case from Brush Pen Hat Pin's Critical Points, R.B. Kenting, probably from the 1500s. Um, experts differ on when this text originates. Um, I personally think it's probably from the mid 1500s. Um, <clears throat> and so this, this starts by saying our distant ancestor was properly buried in a certain district and the lineage commu community established an agreement prohibiting descendants from illicit sale. It was protected for generations without incident. And then this guy came and cut the trees that shade the, shaded the grave. He dug a new grave. We have testimony supporting this. Why does this matter? Okay, it involves the lines of fate of the entire kin group. Um, Yizu Ming Mai Suo Guan. So Ming Mai, uh, lines of fate is a feng shui terminology that is appearing very explicitly in this sample case. And in the very next sentence, how could the contumacious descendant make this illicit sale? Contumacious is a reference to one of the 10 evils in Ming law. This is an explicit reference to formal law. And so this is essentially instructing the magistrate, this is a severe case and we want you to apply the aggravated penalty. And so this is a plaint that was written by someone who had both a passing knowledge of feng shui and a passing knowledge of Ming law um, and is arguing that damage to feng shui um, should, be, um, should be adjudicated as an issue of desecration 
and that the um, aggravated penalty should apply. This is really exciting. In addition, the commentary, which is in italics here, um, the author of this, um, the falsehood dispelling hermit, articulates his theory of, um, of how to deal with, with, with grave litigation. So on other properties, each party can sell his own share. Only for grave mountains is this not permitted. Even if the sale has already been registered with the state, the seller must pay to redeem it, or sorry, the buyer must pay to redeem it and the seller cannot refuse. Um, I apologize, there's a, there's a typo there. Um, so how we interpret this really hinges on how we date this text and that's a little bit problematic. If we date it to the 1500s, this is basically pushing for the very types of changes that we see in the 1585 clause that gets added to the law on illicit sale of fields and houses. If this appears after 1585, it's responding to that change in the law. One way or another, there's clearly a close relationship between um, where, where these people are aware of what's going on um, in the code, in the new precedent, um, and either pushing for the changes that then are reflected in new precedent or responding to the, those changes. And again, the dating of the text is difficult. We can't be 100% certain which of the two it is. Okay, um, here's another case also from R.B. Kenting. And um, what I wanna focus on here is just the stuff that I bolded. Um, this is another case where, um, where there's a violation of the grave and the, the plaint is begging for an investigation of documentation. What person holds the deed of sale? What household pays the tax responsibility? And so once again, <clears throat> we see that even in these cases that potentially involve feng shui, they are also interested in contractual documentation. They're also interested in the contractual property regime. Nonetheless, if we look at the author's commentary on this case. Once again, um, the falsehood dispelling hermit tells us the case of a grave mountain is different than other mountain plots. An individual person is not allowed to sell it in private. Um, nonetheless, it is never permitted to impinge on a grave. And he notes that graves theoretically have restricted paces. There's theoretically this square plot around the grave, which is what you're not allowed to impinge on. But he ends by saying, it is now common to extend these boundaries in all directions. I interpret this as meaning that even though theoretically this is what a grave um, plot gives you, actually people are using feng shui to claim things all along the, the, the mai, the veins that supply the grave with energy, with qi. Um, okay, I'm gonna show you another one. This is from Totally Terrifying Legal Masters, um, Fa Jia To Dan Han, um, and this, text. One of the reasons why I think this is later than the RB Kenching is that we have um, suits and countersuits. We have multiple perspectives reflected in the text. They start to get more complicated. Um, and the, the reason that I bring this up is um, mostly just to show you that this is a dispute within a lineage. And so we have some members of the lineage saying, this guy, our cousin, whoever it is, can't bury his his father there because it's disrupting the qi flow. It's messing with the feng shui of the lineage. He can't bury his father there. And the other guy is saying, wait, why can't I bury my father there? You all got to bury your ancestors there. I'm a member of the lineage too. And so we're seeing that even within lineages, um, this logic of feng shui is being used to articulate who gets what rights. And there's this sort of inequality of bro among brothers, which is characteristic of, of Chinese lineages, um, to borrow a turn of phrase from, from Ruby Watson. Um, okay, here I have a set, um, another set of suits and countersuits, which I think, which come from the same um, collection, Totally Terrifying Legal Masters, which is exciting because it clearly shows that people are claiming things beyond their, their properties. And so what we're seeing here is that um, Chu wants to dig a grave that is impinging on Wei's residence. And then, then we get the desecration, right? Once this dispute starts, which it really starts with this problem of feng shui impingement, then we get a des desecration. Um, and so this is a diagram of what I think is going on in this case. You have 
a descending dragon, a lilong, the ridge line, which is seen as supplying feng shui to both Wei's house on the right and the old Chu grave on the left. And essentially what Wei is arguing is that Chu has put his burial on the central dragon. It's riding the dragon. And so it's therefore disrupting the flow of qi that supplies both the house and the grave. And what Chu is arguing is that um, that's not really what's going on at all. And Wei even articulates that there's an alternative place that Chu can put the grave, which is on this left branch of the arriving dragon. Um, okay, so the details kind of matter. What really matters here is that neither the neither of these plots are directly next to each other. And the place where this grave is being stuck that is causing this dispute is not within the protected area of the old grave. It's not within the plot that around Wei's house, it's somewhere else. And so feng shui is being used to claim some sort of control over the use of land that potentially neither of these people own. Um, and so this is exactly, um, the, the really interesting and exciting thing um, that the courts are going to have to resolve about these feng shui cases. Um, okay, I think this is the last case I'm going to show you. And this is one where we're looking at the different types of rights to resources that can be bought and sold and articulated within grave plots. And so in this case, you have a guy who has an ancestral grave that was planted with pine trees to shade and protect the grave. This is standard, this is what you do, right? You plant trees to protect the grave. And he actually sold the right to some of that wood to another guy. But what he sold him was just the right to remove the small wood, but he was supposed to leave the large trees to shield the grave. And the, the second party took this limited right to, um, to take branches and small wood and used it as a pretense to clear cut all of the trees that shaded the grave. Um, and so this matters because um, the former behavior is something that we frequently see allowed um, by feng shui, allowed within grave plots, the removal of, of firewood and things like that. Whereas the latter, the removal of grave trees is something that was significantly more problematic. And here again, is seen as bringing disaster on the ancestral grave. So these are my takeaways um, from these cases, and there are more um, that I would love to have the time to share with you. So the first is that graves appear within the contractual land regime, but because of feng shui, taboos extend beyond plot boundaries. Second, we see disputes both within lineages and between families of different surnames, and feng shui is being used in both. Third, there are certain behaviors, I didn't show you any cases of this, but there are plenty of these. Um, there are certain behaviors that are almost always prohibited. Grazing animals, plowing, modifying the landform. Um, Tristan Brown has actually shown the things like oil mills are another thing that's incredibly problematic for feng shui. Latrines, um, public toilets are also always bad. Um, there are other behaviors that are generally permitted, um, at least in limited volumes and at least within the lineage community, or occasionally, as we saw in one of those cases, sold out. And these include things, relatively low impact behaviors like gathering fuel, bamboo, mushrooms, things like that. But the behaviors that cause the most dispute are permitted in some cases, but only with the agreement of the lineage collective. And these include principally burials and logging. And you may notice that these are precisely the items that led to the clarification of dynastic law. It was precisely these things that were hardest to resolve um, in these feng shui cases that lead to clarifications in the law in the chain. Okay, I'm gonna use my last little bit of time to talk about the way that grave, um, that, sorry, that feng shui impacts the type of evidence that is brought in court and um, if you're interested in this, I really can't recommend Tristan Brown's new book, Laws of the Land, too highly. Um, he has a ton of this material and talks about it in, in really interesting and exciting ways. But what, what I want to show you here is how feng shui theory 
makes its way into the court of law. And so what we see at the left is this is an illustrated explanation of the distinguishing dragon's rhyme. It doesn't matter what the specifics are. This comes out of a feng shui manual. And so this is a this is an illustration that is used to explain a particularly arcane set of feng shui um, theory, of feng shui um, belief. In the middle, what we see is a very similar sort of diagram that I, I think I showed you before, um, which is out of a genealogy. And, um, and we see diagrams of this type start starting to appear in genealogies by about the 17th century. Um, and there are written descriptions of feng shui forms that appear in genealogies even earlier than that. Um, certainly by the 11th or 12th century, you can see um, textual uh, representations of feng shui landforms, um, but these sort of visual depictions. And so what we've seen here is that lineages have taken um, this way of representing the land and the flow of energy through the land and all of these arcane ideas um, about uh, luck and the flow of influences, and they are putting it in their genealogies. And I think that one of the major reasons that they're putting it in their genealogies is so that they can use it as evidence. Um, evidence that this is their um, this is their tzatang in this case, this is their ancestral temple or their grave or what have you. And these are the landforms around it that impact it. And we know that that matters because courts accepted that. Um, I don't have hard evidence that courts accepted that in the 17th century, but Tristan, um, Professor Brown has provided us with hard evidence that they did accept it in the 19th century. And that's what we have on the right. Um, this is a, um, a document from, from Nambu County in Northern Sichuan, um, where there is a dispute going on, very much like the types of disputes that I showed you. It has to do, I think, with a grave being dug that was held to affect another grave. And so the magistrate sends out his clerk to draw a diagram of this situation. And this diagram is replete with the same sort of arcane feng shui terminology and theory that we've seen in these other two pictures. And this is in fact used by the court to resolve the dispute. He figures out that actually the direction of the grave didn't impact the other grave the way that the, the other person claimed based on drawing a feng shui diagram. And so this brings me back to something that I mentioned in passing a little bit earlier, which is that there's actually substantial overlap between these groups of people who were involved in these two things, in feng shui and in litigation. Um, a lot of them are drawn from this class of failed examination candidates or sort of marginal um, supernumerary officials or things like this who need to make some money and they're literate people. And so how do they make money? One of the ways they make money is by writing lawsuits um, you know, for, for, for cash, right? Another way that they make money is sometimes by being clerks at, at the, for the local officials or being legal advisors to the local officials. And another way that they make money is as feng shui experts because they can read these manuals and give advice based on them. Um, and so I think this is gonna bring me to my tentative conclusions. The first is that early Ming law left ambiguities around graves and other ritually significant sites. Um, it doesn't really specify what's supposed to be going on here the way that was specified much more clearly in Song Law, for example. And feng shui provided a logic to claim rights both within and beyond the contractual regime and therefore forced a resolution of these ambiguities. I have argued that grassroots, grassroots litigation was the initial mechanism that brought these issues to the Ming courts and that unrecognized intermediaries, including litigation masters, clerks, feng shui masters, who in some cases were the same people, um, were key to this process. By the mid 1700s, feng shui litigation had opened new room for claiming common pool resources within the Qing land system. And the persistence of feng shui suggests that there was a need for this sort of mechanism within and beside the system of property rights. And so I'd like to return to some of these questions that I asked um, in the theoretical section earlier in the talk. Is feng shui a form of commons regulation? 
I don't think it's just this. It has a lot of other aspects to it, but is this what it is doing legally? Um, it emerges most strongly around sites that are associated with both club goods, things like lineage membership, ability to participate in rituals, things like that, and common pool goods, including forests, graveyards, things like that, to enforce the line, I think, between non-rivalrous goods, goods that could be shared among the group without being damaged, and those that could be exhausted by overuse. And so, as we saw in one of those cases, articulating the line between someone who could be part of the lineage and therefore participate in the rituals, but who could not necessarily bury his father in the shared graveyard. Second, feng shui seems to work best when it was paired with strong property rights and clear law. Um, and in particular, it's because law, I think, provides some things for commons regulation that feng shui itself does not do a very good job of. Um, and uh, neither for that matter do, do sort of lineage organizations and, um, and their institutional norms and things like that. In particular, feng shui doesn't really specify clear boundaries. That's something that the formal law is needed for. It doesn't really specify clear sanctions. That's something that the law is needed for. Um, and it doesn't really provide a clear mechanism for dispute resolution. Again, sometimes some of this could be done within the lineage through lineage rules and stuff like this, but the law and this process of litigation um, seems to be something that they turn to as a way of, um, of further assuring the protection of these common pool resources. I'm gonna end this by asking a question that I don't have an answer for, um, but it's something that I, I'm thinking about. And this is this question about, are property rights derived from this idea of taboo? Um, and if that is the case, is feng shui a persistence of these pre-modern forms of taboo-based property rights in a contractual system? Again, I'm not sure that I, I figured out an answer to this question yet, but I think it's an interesting one. There are a few complexities that I am aware of and that I don't have the expertise or the time or to address. Um, feng shui applies to a lot more than just graves, to houses, schools, to entire cities. Again, I would recommend Tristan Brown's book if you're interested in reading more on this. Feng shui has a time component as well as a space component. This is an area where I really don't know a huge amount. Um, third, feng shui has multiple complex regional traditions, including the well-known Jiangxi or form school and the Fujian or um, direction or compass school, as well as an imperial tradition. There's a pretty good book on the imperial tradition um, where dragon veins meet that, that came out pretty recently. Also, I have really limited my inquiry to the South and in particular to sort of the central South. I really don't know what's going on in the North. There are some feng shui traditions there as well, um, but I, I, I don't really know enough to comment on that. Um, and so I'm not sure whether what I, everything I've just said is basically limited to this belt of, um, of provinces in the sort of central South. Thank you very much. This has been a very long lecture, I realize, and um, and so thank you for your attention. And I'm very excited to see what what questions or comments you might have. Thank you very much, Professor Miller. Not too long at all, just on time. We've got a few minutes left for questions, anyway. But thank you very much. I'm sure uh, many of us will have uh, lots of of takeaways to do with uh, feng shui and burial lands and all of that was developed. I'm sure quite a lot of people will think of the. The Ming and the Qing age is a golden age when it was illegal to be a litigating lawyer. I think that's probably a great idea. <laughs> and uh, also, you know, the, the names of the authors, as you said, they're wonderful, aren't they? In this age of fake news, perhaps people should call themselves the falsehood, falsehood dispelling hermit. It's a great name, isn't it, for a, a lawyer? Um, we've got a number of questions, as you said, but we've only got a few minutes left. But let me try and get some of these into you. Uh, um, thank you for a fascinating talk. Uh, you mentioned that uh, in the in the similar the Juan period, grave law shaped general land law, property law. Can you elaborate on any evidence supporting this conclusion? I think you were sort of touching on that at the end as well. So, um, yeah. So um, this this first case book that I put up here, um, the Enlightened Judgments, um, sometimes called the the Mingguang um, Shupan Qing Mingji, um, is one of, if not the earliest extant case books that we have. And there are um, 
seven or eight cases in this that have to do with um, with the interaction between um, graves and property rights. And um, this is where I pulled some of the sort of general information about um, the song is, is out of this case book. Um, there's also a lot of other cases on the resolution of other types of property disputes. And so um, it's really instructive to compare them. And um, I mean, without getting into any great detail here, um, they deal with almost exactly the same issues that I showed you in some of the Ming and Qing case books. Um, but the resolutions, well, the, we know the resolutions and they're, they're often different. So for example, um, the Song magistrates were very adamant about the grave plot being limited to a square of a certain number of paces. I can't remember off the top of my head how many paces it is. Um, and every time that that was challenged, I mean, it's not that many cases, so we can't know for sure, but at least in the cases that we have, every time that that was challenged, um, it was um, rejected. And they they respected this principle of limiting the special protections of graves to this square plot. Regarding the Yuan, um, the the main source that we have for the yuan where where is my slide um is um is the yuan tianzhang which is a really interesting text um it's sort of strange text so the yuan did not compile a formal code they thought about it they sort of didn't um but then there were some yuan officials um who were um you know han chinese they, they weren't mongols and they were like well we need a code so let's just pull together a bunch of the precedent and, and compile this, you know, make this, this thing. And so that's what that is. And so this is where we can see um, how, how grave law develops in the Yuan. And I honestly have not um, had the chance of comparing uh, the way that grave law develops to the way other property law develops in the Yuan. And so regarding that part of the question, I don't have a great answer. I would, I would have to do a little bit more reading um to to figure that out um but it's a it's a really great question and and one of the problems that that honestly i face and um we face as historians especially when we cover long periods of time is the the basis of evidence is very very different um for different periods of time so we have one type of evidence from the 12th from the 13th century and a very different set of evidence from the 14th century and a very different set of evidence from the 15th or 16th century and then once you get to the 1800s, um, 17, 1800s, there's a ton more material. Um, and, and so we can say with a, a lot more certainty. And so really anything this early is based on a fairly thin amount of cases and it's a little bit speculative, but this is, this is the best of my understanding of it. Thank you. Um, as I said, we've got quite a few questions, but I know we're, we're rapidly running out of time. So maybe I'll just ask you this last one. You mentioned that during the Ming Qing, most Feng Shui cases came from Zhangxi. Uh, why? Why would Zhangxi be the area? In well, so in the early Ming, um, I don't know the answer to that question, but I think that it it comes out of um, maybe two things. So so one is that um, lineages strong lineage organizations form earlier in central Jiangxi and maybe like Huizhou and a few other places than they do in a lot of places that are now known for having very powerful lineage organizations like Fujian or Guangdong or places like that. And um, the reason for that is, I mean, um, I, I, I would probably have to write a, a book on that, but um, um, I think it's because they go back to the song. A lot of the lineages in the, in central Jiangxi go back to the Song, and so I think that these magnate um, conflicts that are coming up in the mid Ming materials are basically these powerful old lineages asserting their dominance, and it's something that happened probably earlier in this part of the South than in some other regions, but that maybe um, happens a little bit later in other places. Another thing is it's just notorious for, for litigation. I don't know why, but Jiangxi is, litig is notorious for litigation going back to the Song. Um, aside um, uh, trivia that, that maybe is interesting to this audience, there's actually someone in the Song 
who proposes that lawyers be legalized um, and, and who tries to basically start a law school. And this goes nowhere, of course, um, but that's where it is. It's, I, I forget exactly where it is, but it's somewhere in, in, um, in Jiangxi. And so uh, <clears throat> uh, I think it's some combination of these things, but I don't have a really great answer for that, um, aside from what I've already given you, yeah. A law school sounds like a terrible idea. <laughs> I, I, look, um, I'm, I'm going to give it the official thanks to you uh, shortly, but just thank you so much for such an interesting topic. Really interesting to see that prohibition on the sale of the grave lands and, and how far it went to actually recover the property, because that's a big issue in Hong Kong at the moment with our lineage trusts in the new territories. Because of the expansions and the buildings that are going on in the new territories, the government needs land to build on. And one issue is whether our lineage trusts, our Joes and Tongs, can actually sell off their ancestral lands. Can actually, it, in our common law, it's been interpreted that they can't. And we're actually speculating on whether we need a legislative change to actually allow them to do this. So it's really interesting to see that this was going on, you know, 800, 1,000 years ago or whatever else and going through as well. So thank you very much, uh, Professor Miller, for a great talk. Very, very interesting talk. Also, thank you so much for staying up late into, well, now into the early morning, I think is your time at present as well. Thank you for sharing your slides with us. So yeah, on behalf of uh, CUHK Law and everyone who's here today, thank you so much for your presentation. And we are now just gonna publicize uh, a few upcoming events. So my colleague Jay, thanks to Jay and the team for actually um, organizing everything. But Jay, if you can share the, the other slides. So upcoming events, the next, uh, definitely the speaker won't be as good in the next Chinese, uh, Greater Chinese Legal History Seminar Series, because unfortunately that's me uh, at the beginning of February. I'll be talking about Chinese customary marriage and concubinage in Hong Kong uh, much more recently uh, uh, than Professor Miller. And our next event after that is, oh, I think these are preceding events, aren't they? Yes, in uh, 15th of January, uh, we've got the latest in our Center for Comparative and Transnational Law, Environmental, Energy and Climate Law cluster uh, seminars as well. So please join us for that. And then we have uh, another seminar with the same cluster, China's Energy Security and its Growing Role in Global Energy Governance as well on the 22nd of January. And then, of course, we have our Dean, Professor Lutz Christian Wolf, who will be talking about a hot topic uh, to do with um, legal work and artificial intelligence. That's on the 25th of January, an early evening seminar. So please join us for this, uh, delegating all legal work to AI, why not? And I'm sure that Professor Wolf will tell us why and why not uh, on that evening seminar as well. So again, thank you everyone for joining us today. I know that we had about just under, I think, 400 participants at times today. So thank you so much for joining us. Sorry to those of you who put questions in and I didn't have an opportunity to actually ask them. And thank you once again to Professor Miller uh, for a fascinating seminar um, and look forward to seeing everyone at the next CUHK Law events and particularly, of course, at the next CUHK Law Greater China Legal History Seminar. Bye bye. <music>